Yo peeps, welcome to Conspiracy Club. But today we're going to be looking into the Penturk incident in Wales. This is probably the most well, most evidence I've ever found for a UFO cover up, a UFO being shot down over the goddamn UK, man. It's like it happened over the UK. So let's get into this. Q title sequence. <laughs> There we go, Tata sequence away. So welcome everybody to the Conspiracy Cupboard. So today we're going to be covering something very close to home, okay? A UFO incident that is is absolutely mind-blowing. And if true, which it very much seems to be, shows that our government is covering up the presence of extra-dimensional beings or extraterrestrials and knows basically what's going on. So all the stuff we're getting from Congress in America. I know a lot of people are a bit like, yeah, they didn't really show anything. But as we're trying to explain to you, this is just the start. They got these people to come forward and give their testimonies on under oath, you know, and, and say what they have seen, what they've witnessed, what they've been told and start the process. Now, everyone thinks that this is just like an America thing. Nothing ever happens. Well, get ready for this. So the Pentateuch incident is a small village in Wales, uh, just outside of Cardiff. And uh, this incident that took place uh, has been covered up by the UK government, by the MOD, by Wales police, Cardiff police, um, as a apparent training exercise that was going off. So I've got some clips to pay for you then from Central. They uh, do um, a lot of interviews and uh, this one is with Kaz Clark. And um, it's probably one of the best interviews that I've seen with her where she's sat down and can give an account. And she's with Gary, a UFO researcher that has basically been helping her along to uncover stuff from this incident. So I'm going to give you a quick overview uh, and then we're going to get into the interview. Uh, so uh, this interview then is with Cass Clark, like I've just said. I'm going to be bringing up some other people and some other witnesses to back up this as well. There's another interview portion that I'm going to be showing you as well from the Paranormal Scholar. So if you don't follow any of these channels, please go and check them out. I'm going to link them below. Um, and the incident took place in 2016, as I've said over Penturk, uh, near Cardiff, and eventually uh, over Smeedle, well, Smilog Woods. Smilog. Sounds like something out of Lord of Rings, doesn't it? Smilog Woods, which is the Clantissant Forest uh, area, uh, where eventually a UFO was reportedly shot down there. So, I'm going to go over to Kaz now uh, and let you listen to the account as she came in and I'll be cutting in and giving my thoughts uh, through the process. So here we go. At the beginning, um, it actually started for me on the Tuesday and it was my neighbor, David, that first noticed this very small gray twin prop plane just flying very low and very slow over my village, which is Penturk. Um, I didn't pay it any mind. We got RAS St. Athen 14 miles away and we have military aircraft that pass through quite regularly, but None of them seemed to stick around and stay. Um, Wednesday morning was when we really started to pay attention to these aircraft. And David came out of his house and he was cursing because this small aircraft had kept him awake all night. And as you can appreciate, Penturk is extremely quiet at night. And so anything like that, uh, a small prop plane flying very low over your house is extremely loud and very annoying. So all Wednesday night, I had a very restless night. So I'm just going to cut in here a second. Uh, I've just got to say, I love the sound of her voice. I, I think, Kaz, if you're listening, if you end up watching this, I think you need to do some audio book narrations. Um, now, I'm just going to say that she does have some, a book out, and there is a website that you can go to, which I'm going to link in after this. So uh, let's get back into the story. Sorry, I just had to say, uh, just listen to her voice during this interview. It's, it's beautiful. I love it. Now, David had written to the Ministry of Defence, and they did not reply. Uh, he'd also written to Wells Online, and they did not reply either. 
Um, so when you've eliminated everything else, it was quite clear that they were watching for something. These two aircraft, one at a time, by the way, would bunny hop with each other when they changed shifts to go off and refuel. And then they would stay for another eight hours or so, and then the other plane would come back and take its place. Well, we decided that if it was still there Thursday night, that we would go out and watch with them because clearly they were watching for something. No exercises were listed, no notams were posted, uh, and certainly when they closed the entire Welsh airspace, it drew our attention that something was really going on. Now David had said that perhaps they were watching for Russian planes again because it was only the week before that we turned away two TU-160 bombers, Russian bombers, mm. from our airspace. Our plane that had gone from flying in circles to flying in figure of eight patterns over the top of my house, roughly every seven minutes. And it got to about 2 a.m. And I said to David, it's freezing. I'm going to go in. Nothing's happening. So again, I just want to say uh, it's a logical approach. They were thinking of actual things going off. Obviously, the uh, military air base is not too far from there. They see a lot of stuff, but this is very unusual. E3 Century Plane, okay? Big craft, okay? Huge radar on top of it, loads of technology. And I think this is very important for what's coming next, okay? Because what's coming next is the mind-blowing part, okay? The 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 bit that I'm going to be getting into, and it, it links to a few videos that I've done before of... Um, you know, a connection between other dimensions, possibly, um, rather than extraterrestrials, maybe interdimensional beings. So just before I carry on with the rest of this portion of the interview, um, I just want to say that obviously this setup, okay, so the planes have been seen, they've been circling, you know, they've got the tracking information there. I'm going to put this up again in a little bit so you can look a bit longer at the tracking information. And some other bits because on the interview that you see there the things sort of flash up you don't really get long to see it so i've taken portions from there so central i'm giving you a shout out again uh i've, I've nicked some of your bits from here because I, I couldn't uh, have time to search for them so i'm just going to pull them up so people can look at them longer um so they were there they've been circling they've been looking for two or three days before and now they've got a signal they've picked up something which is why this plane is coming in this E3 century, okay? So they know something is there, so let's carry on. A bit bored, to be honest, you know. And I just got to my back door, and I just placed my hand on the back door handle, and I heard what sounded like a missile coming. And I ran to the back of my garden to see this huge plane go over the top. We had almost a full moon. It just ebbed over the, small, the full moon. And as it banked around to the left-hand side, so you could see this, mushroom-shaped object on his back, and David exclaimed, that's an E3 Sentry plane. Well, that meant absolutely nothing to me back then. All I knew was I just about identify a Cessna, if I was lucky, you know. Um, I know an awful lot more now because of the meticulous, in-depth military timeline that Gary Jones, the investigator, has put together. Uh, because this plane had turned up, we decided we'd watch a little longer. And you can see in every direction but north in Penturk, because that's where the actual mountain is, for a good 14 miles on a clear day. And this plane started to circle, not small circles, big circles. And we estimate it took a few minutes for it to go around just once. And seven times this plane circled. David said perhaps it's taxiing for the airport. The only airport large enough to accommodate a plane of that size would have been Cardiff International where you wouldn't expect to see an E3 Sentry plane. This was a NATO plane, not RAF. The seventh time it went around, one red light became visible high above the trees, above the fields behind my house. There's nothing behind my house except farmland that ebbs away from you. And I'd called for Donna, one of our other neighbours who'd been watching with us that night, and she'd gone in to make us all hot drinks. I called a second time, didn't get an answer. So I said to David, come on, and we ran, jumped over the small wire fence and ran to the five bar gate that overlooks the farmland behind my house to get an unobstructed view as to what was going on. The E3 Sentry was still above us. This point now flying in an oval flight pattern, flying out towards Llantricent, about five miles away, turning and coming back. 
and one red light was followed by two more that formed a triangle shape. And the nearest set of lights on its underside were brighter than the rest. And slowly but surely, it emerged out of the darkness. This thing did not come down from outer space. This thing came through the space. Set of lights, the nearest flying in horizontally, point first, turning very slowly anti-clockwise, and as it did so, came down in a pendulum motion, the leading set of lights still brighter than the rest. Um, I remember as it went past the trees, it looked like train carriages, you know, with the lights behind the silhouetted black trees. And I stood on the five-bar gate to get a, a better look through the bare trees. When it was in the upright position, it's fired this really bright green object out of the top. And I didn't know until recently what shape that was because it was too bright. It's moved across to my left-hand side and above the trees and just rocked there, backwards and forwards gently, almost surveying the area. Uh, the pyramid, meanwhile, the three-sided pyramid, is still is listed to the right-hand side but still moving anti-clockwise away from us. And as it neared the ground, I said to David, it's landing, it's landing, thinking it was coming down. When in reality, the ground there rises and it is the foot of the Garth Mountain. So the land was coming up to meet it. And it ejected this hand I described like a hand of lightning. Not thin lightning like we have here, thick fire-coloured lightning. And the whole thing lit up really brightly and around the brightest lights you could see that this was a solid craft and not a string of lights. I heard the military planes coming. I now know to be two C-17s, huge aircraft with two engines on each wing. Uh, and they were flying wingtip to wingtip. And I looked up just to see them go over the top of me. And when I looked back, I couldn't see the pyramid anymore. That's not to say it wasn't there. I just couldn't see it because there's no light pollution there. It's pitch black. And the green object that had been there the whole time I'd moved across and in front of these aircraft. Two further aircraft have come from my left-hand side. I now know to be two C-130 Hercules aircraft. And they've gone back in behind the two C-17s. So you've got the C-17s in close and the C-130s out wide. And between them, they took up the entire visible airspace. The green object has now fired three really bright strobes at these aircraft. I think in an attempt to get their attention, to get them to follow it, and that's exactly what we did. And it seemed to get excited somehow, and it skipped, I described, like Tigger on Winnie the Pooh. It skipped and bobbed away into the distance. I just want to say, I love the uh, analogy there of it skipping away like Winnie the Pooh. Um, I just want to interject here, because a lot of people pick up stuff like that, okay? Like um, someone, uh, Russell Brand did a video on the Tic Tac incident, and he kept going, who called it a tic tac light? And it was just a thing, basically, that Chad Underwood had come in and said, you know, he described it as looking like a tic tac uh, because he kind of thought it was funny, you know, uh, from a film uh, where they're describing something and he says it looks like this. And uh, he's, you know, so he did that. But um, yeah, that description there. But what, I'm, what I what I just want to interject with, <laughs> apart from the Winnie the Pooh statement, is how she describes it coming in to our world, not from space, not from, you know, just appearing through the ether, through, not like a stargate, not a wormhole, nothing like that, just appearing, you know, which leads me to think, are these things already from here, or just the dimension above us that we can't see, that we can only see on psychedelics, as I've mentioned before in a few other videos, so just something to think about. Let's carry on. With the four aircraft behind it, the E3 Sentry was still above us and it bathed all of the aircraft in green light and I watched it until I couldn't see it anymore. Whilst I was looking at the bottom of that pyramid, David was looking at the top. He said he saw 15 or 20, he described as orbs, come out of the top of this pyramid and I didn't see any of them because I was fixated on it touching the ground. These things didn't make any noise at all. And after the green object had gone, we were approached by two barrel-shaped objects. They were capped on the top and on the bottom with just black caps. They were completely smooth on the outside. And all the insides were moving, like white noise on a TV screen, but it was mixing in on itself, like it was more 3D than that. 
and one of them, they were both red in colour, towel like red, moved across and above the hedge to my left hand side, about 20 feet away and about 20 feet up. And I stared at it just for a few seconds because I wanted the details. I wanted to see. Uh, and then I looked to see where the other one was and that hadn't stopped them by that time. That was right over the top of me. And the only thing I could think to do was to wave with all the military activity going on. I didn't want us to appear to be hostile. And for me, that had to have been the universal signal for hello. And I don't mean you any harm. And the red barrel changed colour from tail light red to traffic light green. And I could see even clearer the insides moving, mixing in on itself. And I did hear a man's voice, a man's voice, not my voice. Tell the world what you witnessed here. And I said that remained sentry the whole time over the hedge, moved away to my left hand side and low across the fields. And I watched that until I couldn't see it anymore. And the now green barrel has moved away to my right hand side and above the rooftops of the houses. Now David and I had moved down or walked down to the second field where this pyramid had come in because he said he saw 15 or 20 of these objects and we wanted to see if there were any more. Our phones didn't work. David's was completely fried. Mine, I knew was fully charged, was completely flat. We had almost a full moon in the shadow of the hedgerows and the trees. The ground was pitch black and slippery uneven and uneven. And this is a mountain in the middle of the night. When we got down to what we call the second gate, it was pitch black. There was nothing we could see. When we were walking back towards the first gate, we heard the helicopters coming. There were three Apache helicopters, one above two, flying in a pyramid formation. You could see the red lights pulsing out in front of them, slowly pulsing. You could see all the grass and the hedgerows and everything being pushed flat by the force of their rotor blades. And they were moving from my left to my right on an interception course where that green object had gone, that first green object in the Clantrison area. We watched them go across the fields and then ran around the front of the houses to get a better look up the valley, but by the time we got there, they were already out of sight. We went back to my house. David was catatonic, sat there staring into the abyss, trying to make sense of everything that had just happened. It's an enormous explosion. This was not a bang. This was a kaboom from five miles away in the Clantrison area. And I knew then... They'd shot that green object down. So, wow. <laughs> um, just stop it there one second. The barrel objects approaching them, the lightning coming down to the ground, the objects coming out the top, you know, and as you're going to see in a minute, we've actually got backup evidence now, not just what, what they're on there, but from hundreds of people that phoned in, that phoned the police, reporting the same thing. So I've got... This here, which is uh, Mike Henbury. He phoned the police uh, on the evening, I think it was about half past two, not long after the event, to report seeing a red triangle pyramid object. This is same time being seen floating over and coming, just appearing out of the clouds or out of somewhere and moving across towards the fields where they saw it at the same time. So... And then you've got other reports of lights and orbs and objects in the sky on the same evening, phoning up as this was happening. <laughs> okay. So, and then the Apache helicopters. So there's reports of the Apache helicopters coming in. The planes that they saw as well that were circling in were the Hercules and the Globemasters. Um, you know, this is just, it's absolutely insane. Now, the way that she describes these barrels that come to her are, I it, to me, it's, it sounds like they're the a life form of some kind or have life inside them. Now, um, later on in a few interviews, she describes them as, as feeling like the essence of, of life. And I'm so glad that she did what she did. So obviously when they approached, they were red and she didn't know what to do other than wave what would you let me know in the comments what would you do if you were approached by two floating or barrels um would you would you wave would you i don't know you know i, I 
hope that I would wave, you know, and show that I don't mean them any harm. And now she says that she was bathed in a green light. And uh, as you'll see a bit later on in a couple of interviews, uh, that she felt euphoric, she felt lifted. Um, the fear went away from her and she heard this man's voice saying, you know, like she said there, tell people what you've seen here today. Now, as you're going to see uh, in a minute, uh, in the morning, uh, David came round to show her this article from Wales Online. So here we go. Um, and he burst through my door saying how Wales Online had put out this cover story of a military exercise. Well, I didn't know you weren't supposed to talk about UFOs. So I immediately launched into a comment that I can categorically state that that was no exercise. What they were chasing last night were not planes. I will take a lie detector for anyone, anywhere. But what I witnessed last night will stay with me for the rest of my life. And I did have two debunkers. One of them called themselves the smoking man because they like their little jokes using a fake Facebook profile. And the other one called himself Agent Fox Mulder. And they tried to ridicule, you know, LOL, good one. And I said, yeah, it was good, wasn't it? So you may have chased and shot down the green object, but you left all the others here, didn't you? So they fell silent very quickly because I don't think they wanted me to say any more. The same morning, Steve and one of my friends had come over to my house and we went over to what we called the, the near landing field where this hand of lightning came out of this craft, expecting to see burn marks on the ground. Um, but everything was dead. All the grass, it seemed as if all of the chlorophyll had been sucked out of it. Um, and it was snowing just in the one field. So, hand of lightning draining the chlorophyll, what was it searching for? What was it doing? Was it taking energy from a site? Now, there's lots of ancient sites around there. Uh, obviously, we're talking South Wales. This obviously leads off into the south of England there, where you've got Stonehenge and Avebury and all these other ancient sites around here and lots of crop circles are seen down there. What was it doing? Now, the description there, obviously, she gives of the chlorophyll being gone and it's snowing in that area. She gives a similar description when they went out to investigate where this thing had been shot down. So the Apaches apparently followed this thing over to the clandestine woods area, the uh, Smilog Woods, and shot it down over there. And it came in and crashed in Smilog Woods. A crash retrieval team was sent out. Okay, don't believe me. There were two people camping in the woods like that. I'm not sure what the guys were doing. Uh, they admit they were a little bit drunk. Uh, they are survivalists. They are on record uh, giving a statement. So here Some we go. Some words are a little because of the software I had to use to do it, but most of it is dead accurate. And um, I've changed his voice because obviously I need to protect his identity because until maybe a day in the future, he might come forward. Um you know, but we can play that for you. So we're looking down and we can see loads of vehicles and they're all parked up. They're parked in that all here and there. And I can only describe if I'm military sort of shoot this, I assume, what it looked like. And people have been explaining it. I don't know what it's called. They're like all in one suit. Hazmat. That's the one. So yeah. again, and we've seen two or three people walking around in where this object was. That rational thing. And we can see an object, but on, on my honest truth, seeing it there and bits and things all the way, I can't say to you, I seen a UFO. I I can't say I, I seen a plane. As I'm looking at it, obviously we were a bit drunk. At that time, we assumed it was just an aircraft. Any wings or tail sections? Could you see? Any shape to it at all? Any colour? Anything like that? What I could see when we were waiting in the woods when we walked out was I had like a trail maybe so far behind it. Not a long trail from where it was, the object. But there was debris. But I, I can't specifically remember seeing wings. Literally, we've been stepping on the road. I'm walking not even five yards. People come up to us and grabbed us, and I mean grabbed us, like grabbed us. 
here. And they took us behind the truck so we couldn't see anything. And they asked what we doing here, and what we seen. And we just said, we're camping up there, we hear something, body that. And they were like, what, what devices we got? If they check up, or they took our phones. All of a sudden, he, one of them walks off from us and gets in a truck, a pickup truck. So the vehicle. Yeah. And he pulls along, and then they sit us in here. And they, they don't even, I, I can't describe it, it was like an awkward silence. All the way up, down then, to buy, past that hotel, down to buy L'Oreal, and then they drove us up to the bus stop. Do you know where that is in Talbot Green? I do, yeah. And when we pulled up by the bus station, I can only describe it, we sat there for like a minute before they even let us out. But there was no words, they didn't say anything. We were just sat there, and they were, one of them was doing something. And the other one was looking at him and pointing us out towards the driver. And then they opened the door, one of them opened the door and let us out. And they returned our phones. And then, obviously, we didn't check our phones, first of all. But we had passcodes on them. Yeah. But, like, obviously, we were, as soon as we got out, they caught, we were like, what's the exact? So there you go then, there's the guys in the woods. Uh, there's another interview as well that I'm going to show you right now, which is obviously from the same interview there uh, that Gary puts across uh, from a guy that basically saw the Apaches having a standoff with this green object. So here we go, let's cut into this. And for about 15, say 20 seconds, I had a real good view of what was going on with the Apaches. This is the view that I, I remember seeing, I had about 20 seconds. There was like a green light, quite big. It wasn't flashing, it wasn't falling down the sky. It was stationary in the sky and it was simmering. It was like a like a power saw, that's what it looked like. I've, I've never ever seen anything like it in my, my entire life in the sky. Never, nothing. It wasn't a drone, like I said, nothing like that. To the right of it, so here, there was Apache, an attack helicopter, a definitely attack helicopter. It was armed, it was big. And there was another one just by here. So it was like it was like a Mexican standoff, two versus one. And I can remember thinking to myself that that's I mean this is what we're driving past. So I'm like I thought if that moves at any speed, I'll know that it's not from this earth. And it was like it was it was it felt like it was me and the two Apaches were waiting for it to do something. Uh, so I just want to add this in as well. So this is part of the interview. This is just from Gary's own words about Kaz when he first met her. They always talk. We were all wondering about the military because we were all just chatting back and forth. But then Kaz just comes out with it. You know, she was, you know, quite, you know, frantic, but she was composed and very strong in her words and, you know, what she was saying. And she just told everyone in that room, this was not a military exercise. They waited for something, you know, and then you told us about the craft and how it got shot down. And everyone in that room was just like, whoa, you know, I mean, literally, the atmosphere just became electric and people, some people's jaws are open, like, you know, just couldn't believe it. And then the microphone went around to a number of other people talking about block roads, talking about bangs, talking about the hospital. One guy was a nurse who worked there or a doctor or something. The halls were shaking and it filled with smoke. And I was like, this is not a military exercise. You don't do these things over people's land like that. Not that to that degree anyway. <sighs> So, uh, my final clip then for you from somebody else's YouTube channel yeah, is the, uh, Paranormal Scholar. And it's just uh, another uh, bit where she's talking about coming face to face with these uh, orbs. So, let's watch this and I'll, I'll give my final piece on this. Experienced, how could the world ever look the same again? When you got scared, yeah. did you feel scared? Was it a fear of the unknown or do you feel like because you think that they were benign, could you get a sense of that? It felt like, and this is going to sound the most bizarre thing, like somebody had reached in and took the fear away from me. I felt elated, almost light, um, like I'd been touched by something. But it wasn't scary anymore. In fact, I was the complete opposite to Dave. I was energized almost frantically to the point where I had to tell someone 
anyone that would know what to do with this information because I didn't know anyone. I wasn't a member of any groups. I had no belief in UFOs. If I did, then perhaps I would have known half a dozen people I could have written to to have had here on that night because it was quite obvious they were watching for something. This was not an exercise. They had enough firepower up there to take over a small country. This was huge. They set an ambush for this thing. They knew it was coming. I believe that we've got a right to know what was going on. I mean, these, the military are pursuing and shooting these things down. We're not even supposed to know they exist. I and mean, what have they done? Because in my opinion, these things were not hostile. But we seemed to, yes, we'd be naive and foolish to believe all life forms are benign. But we're tarring them all with the same brush. So what does that make us? And um, the people should be told we should have a right to vote on this and not to have it, this information exempted from the public view when they were innocent and we shot them down anyway. So there we go. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what to think of this. I mean, the evidence built up around this is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And the fact that hardly anyone's heard of it or it's not been spoke of, you know, I mean, the fact that the UK, and I've said this a million times now, that the UK have not come forward or done anything about the U UFO, UAP, whatever you want to call it, you know, and the only thing they've ever said about it is mm, there's nothing going on. We don't know anything. <laughs> Obviously, we do know something. This plane that was seen, the E3 Century, it was a NATO plane, you know. So I'm, I'm going to be doing a piece on the Five Eyes. Um, you know, our government ties through the UN, through NATO, to other large governments, which obviously have some kind of crash retrieval program, which is now being brought forward in Congress in America. Um, you know, how much more evidence do we? I mean, this case, please go and look at it yourself if you don't believe me. Uh, here are some of the photos that were on there on the interview. Uh, some other photos and things that I've managed to get for you. Uh, so here we go. Have a look at these. Uh, you've got uh, the timelines of the planes. You know, how long they were circling for. Which is weird enough, as it is. You know, for days before <laughs> the incident. What were they doing? What were they searching for? It seems to me they've flown down like a ley line path. You know, and then come in and then start circling over this area. Knowing something's going to appear. You know, and the description of the pyramid structure. It's not the first time these pyramid structures have been seen. I've never heard of this lightning before. Um, you know, anything like that, but the orbs. Uh, now, there's a Christina. Uh, I'll tag her somewhere in uh, in here. One of her episodes, she talks about this. And the guy, I can't remember, Jimmy, I think his name is. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, he uh, has basically seen something very similar to what Kaz describes uh, as these barrels, um, glowing objects. Uh, I, I find that bit fasc fascinating. That's the most fascinating bit to me. Yeah, cool, there's a pyramid, there's lightning, there's things being shot out, there's this thing being shot down. These guys describe seeing something come down and they don't know what it is, can't really describe what it is. Um, you know, but there's guys in hazmat suits taking stuff away. <laughs> this is in the UK. This is not Roswell. You know, this is not America somewhere. This is the fucking UK. We've got guys in hazmat suits. We've got military exercises, apparently, that were occurring up north. So if you actually watch the interview, you'll, you'll, you'll see more in depth. I've not taken loads of stuff out. I just wanted to cover the bits from her because it's better to get it from her and unfortunately I can't interview her right now <laughs> you know I, I'm going to try and hopefully send something out so I can get an interview with her because I'd love to speak to her um like I say her voice is amazing it, she should do audio books uh, the way she describes stuff is beautiful it's, you're there if you close your eyes and listen to it you are there you're at the five bar gate you're looking over you're seeing this stuff you hear the e3 come over you you know you're looking around going what the hell and then suddenly just out of the darkness you just you know see this object this object coming through you know out of out of where you know from another dimension in, into here or you know um as i like to call it the ether you know the the, the nymph dimension you know it's, it's something that exists just out of our sight you know something that when you're on psychedelics as i've mentioned before you can see you know um but what a 
what a story. Um, so there is a website that you can go to, um, which is done by Kaz, uh, which is the Penrich Incident uh, dot com. <laughs> and on there you can, if so if you're from Penrith or you're from that local area and you want to give your stories, if you haven't, I know this happened in 2016, but there are probably some people that haven't, you know, uh, said anything uh, because the military came forward and said, oh, it was just a military exercise and, you know, the papers covered it up. Now, the interesting facts to this as well are that her comment on this Wells Online thing was taken down, the Wells Online post was taken down as well. Um, she was basically threatened. Uh, as not to come forward to say anything else. Um, people have been sort of put down and not listened to. Uh, the police basically just wrote it all off. Uh, the M4 was shut down. Loads of uh, roads around the area were closed off for the evening and the morning after while they did some kind of search and investigation there and there were military personnel there. You'll find out as well that they uh, had military there basically claiming to be um ground surveyors and then when that wasn't a good enough cover story they were vodafone engineers apparently <laughs> conducting vodafone stuff in the middle of fucking nowhere <laughs> what are you doing uh, vodafone things very complicated uh yeah, you wouldn't understand. So, yeah, uh, let me know what you guys think. Uh, what do you think was going on that night? Were the military searching for them? Did they know they were going to be there? Because that's what Kaz Clark uh, believes. And... That's what it seems to me. Now, if you watch uh, other interviews or other people talking about this, uh, uh, especially on the Christina's channel, uh, when she talks about this, Jimmy goes on in saying that military exercises, uh, they have to let you know. He's correct. He is correct on this. Uh, if you have a military exercise and you bump into someone, they have to tell you it's a military exercise because one, you've got to get out of there, but two, you still have the right actually to walk through a military exercise. <laughs> zone no matter why where you live especially in the uk they have to tell you they have to tell you what they're doing they have to tell you why they're there you know they don't have to give you a load of details to it but at the very least they have to say you know it's a military exercise this is what's going on you might want to get out of the area this never happened on the night. No one was informed, no one down in Wales. And the military exercise that they're talking about uh, basically happened, well, it was meant to be happening up north, not down south, not in Wales. So what's going on there, you know? Um, and they didn't inform anyone. It was lambing season as well, you know? So lambs have bought their sheep. Uh, uh, sorry, sheep have bought their lambs. Lambs have bought their sheep. Sheep have bought their lambs. And that's a crime because then the farmer's losing money. You just kill a load of lambs as well. You've, you've got Apache helicopters flying over shooting stuff. What is going on? Uh, so please let me know in the comments what you guys think um, happened that night down in Wales. Did the military, did the UK military go and chase something? Did we know what's going on? And why did we shoot this thing down? It didn't seem to be hostile to me. Whatever it was doing seemed planned. It seemed like it's done it before. And these barrels approached Kaz and Dave. They didn't harm them. Now Dave said, you know, he, he, he couldn't deal with what was going on with it. But then again, it's one of those things where I've said before, if you have an experience like this, do you really want to fucking tell someone about it? Because you're just going to be seen as crazy. And the only reason Kaz came forward is because she was like, no, this wasn't a bloody military. You're not, you're not covering this up. This was... Something, you know, that's a major experience. So I'm just going to play this last thing for you from the... Um, the paranormal scholar 
of Kaz's experience and um, you tell me what you think happened that night down in Wales and if you've seen anything over the UK please uh, give, send me a message uh, go on to Instagram find the conspiracy cupboard send me a message through there uh, send me an email uh, contact me um, and I will listen to your story we'll try and figure out what's going off and we'll try and link up and figure out what's going on there are thousands of sightings over the UK I also just want to say uh, on this last point uh, an apology <laughs> to um, get me call bell uh, because I watched him on an interview the other day which was on uh, I can't believe it was bloody on now some YouTube news channel I think it is or some British YouTube, British news channel and uh, Nick Pope was on with him and they basically took the piss they played the X-Files music you know they were like get your tinfoil hats ready uh, because this is happening and it was like yeah you do realise this has been going on for a very long time it's happening in Congress this is a serious thing that's going on whether you want to believe it or not gone past the point of believing now to the point of where you know this stuff is going on is it us is it someone that was here before us is it something from outer space i don't know you tell me so right peeps have a good night and i shall see you in the next one <laughs>